Hello everyone, this is just going to be a quick video in which I show you how Fibonacci numbers turn up in the effective resistances of finite ladder-like resistor networks such as the ones that you see on the screen. So the pattern with these resistor networks is you basically got one repeating unit which is just defined by the diagram um, at the very top and then you connect more and more of those repeating units in parallel with each other and build up an increasingly long resistor network as you go down the series. Now it's fairly straightforward to calculate effective resistances for each of these networks just using the fact that resistances in series add up while resistances in parallel you have to add their reciprocals and we know that all of the resistors individually have one ohm resistances so if you apply those rules you get the resistances which i've labeled r1 r2 r3 and r4 where the subscript just indicates how many repeating units we have in each network now if you take a look at the numbers in those various fractions you will recognize them as the fibonacci numbers and we can even get one in there by rewriting that first one instead of just two you write it as a fraction two over one then you've got one two three five 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on. So then the natural question is, firstly, why are the Fibonacci numbers turning up? And secondly, is this just some sort of weird coincidence that we're getting Fibonacci numbers for the first few resistances in the series, or is this going to keep going on forever, no matter how many repeating units we have? Of course, we kind of suspect that it's going to keep going forever, but you never really know whether the pattern is going to continue unless you prove it. So the starting point for our investigation is going to be this recurrence relation that relates the nth resistance to the n minus one resistance. Now, that equation comes straight from the rules for series and parallel resistance combinations. So you can either uh, treat it as an exercise and you know, have fun working through the derivation yourself, or just take a look at my last video in which I derived that in full, but we're gonna take it as a given for the time being. And the way that you can go about solving this um, is to split your Rn into a fraction with a separate numerator and denominator. So you write Rn as Pn divided by Qn. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Then you substitute Pn and Qn in place of Rn and Pn minus one and Qn minus one in place of these Rn minus ones. Multiply the top and bottom of the fraction by Qn minus one and equate the numerators and the denominators of both sides. And you get these two coupled um, linear recurrence relations for Pn and Qn. Again, if anything's not clear there just check out my last video in which I talked about that in a little bit more detail and what we did last time um, is then use linear algebra to solve those coupled um, linear recurrence relations to find the nth term um, Rn as a function of n. This time we're going to take a different point of view and do something which to me is very interesting but is much less mathematically involved. So what I'm going to do is label those equations 1 and 2 just so we know which equations we're talking about and I am going to take equation 1 and just rewrite it in a slightly different way. So the left hand side is still Pn. Instead of 2 Pn minus 1 I'm going to split those 2 Pn minus 1s into two separate terms. So I'm going to write the right hand side as P n minus 1 plus then q n minus 1 and then plus our uh, other p n minus 1 so that you've still got two p n minus 1s in total and I haven't really changed anything. What's the point of that? Well then you look at the first two terms and you recognize p n minus 1 plus q n minus 1 as the right hand side of equation 2 up there. Um, so we can use equation 2 to write that combination as just q n, right? So p n is then equal to q n plus p n minus 1. So what is our new pair of simultaneous equations? Well I'm just going to copy the simultaneous equations from before and the only difference now right is that the first one now has a right hand side of qn plus pn minus 1. Arguably that looks a bit nicer because you don't have that coefficient of 2 there anymore. Now it still may not be obvious what this has to do with the Fibonacci sequence so what I'm going to do to make the connection clear is make a new sequence where I have q's and p's alternating. So what I mean by that is we create a new sequence, the first term is going to be q1, the second term is going to be p1, then I go to q2, p2, and we just keep having uh, pairs of q and then p, so q3, p3, and so on up to uh, qn and pn. And that's perfectly fine to do. There's nothing to stop us from making our own sequence out of two other sequences, q and p. Um, now, what do we know about this sequence that we've made? Well, we know the first two terms because remember that r1 was just 2 or 2 over 1. And so we can take p1 to be 2 because that's the numerator and q1 to be 1. So let me just write those there. q1 is going to be 1 and p1 is going to be 2. Now how do these rules tell us how to get the subsequent terms? Well the next term that we need is q2. Um, so to get qn, the second equation here is telling us to take the previous p 
and the previous queue and add those together and that gives you the next queue right so i take the previous Q and the previous P and I add those together. So then you do that, you calculate your Q2 um, and then you need to calculate the next term which is now a P. So you go to your first rule in those simultaneous equations and that tells you that to calculate a given P you take the corresponding Q, right? So if you're looking for P2 you take Q2 and you take the previous P. So in this case we need P1. So if I had to draw some arrows on our sequence down there you're taking P1 and Q2 and adding those together and combining them into P2. And then let's do a couple more of these just to make sure the pattern's clear. To find Q3, you go back to your second rule. Uh, to find Q3, you need to add the previous P and the previous Q, right? So I take this one and this one, combine them into Q3. And then of course you go back to your other rule and it tells you to combine those two to get P3 and so on. Now, when you write the sequence out like this, it becomes very clear that the rule to get to any given term is that you just add together the previous two terms. And that specifies all of the terms as long as you um, give the values of Q1 and P1, the first two terms in the sequence. So you need to specify this one and this two in order to calculate all of the subsequent terms. So with that connection to the Fibonacci sequence in mind, a sensible alternative notation to use for that sequence would be, we just call the first number F1, F2, and so on, all the way up to F6 in this case and beyond. So I'm saying F1 is the first Fibonacci number, F2 is the second Fibonacci number, and so on. Now, Note that there are different conventions for the Fibonacci numbers in terms of where you start. So if you look at other sources, they might not say that F1 is 1 and F2 is 2. Um, another common convention, for example, is to start with 1 and 1. But starting from 1 and 2 is a perfectly valid thing to do. So just so that you're aware, there are other conventions for um, the subscripts of those Fibonacci numbers. So that allows us to write a general expression for Rn in terms of the Fibonacci numbers Fn. So just by comparing these two sequences, you can see that Pn um, is just the same as F2n, right? P1 is F2, P2 is F4, P3 is F6, and so on. So that generalizes to F subscript 2n um, on the top and on the bottom, because the Qs are just always one position earlier than the Ps, the denominator has to just be F subscript 2n minus 1. And so we've proved that this relationship with the fractions and Fibonacci numbers is going to be true forever, uh, however many repeating units you have. If you wanted to take that even further, you could use the expression for the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence, uh, plug that into the top and the bottom, making sure that you put n as 2n on the top and n as 2n minus 1 um, on the bottom, and come up with an nth term for the resistance. Now, that's a totally different method from what we did last time using linear algebra, but it's interesting to see that you can do it this way. Um, if you want to have a go at that, I do have another video from a few years ago in which we derived the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence. Another property of Rn that follows quite quickly from our result here uh, is that as n goes towards infinity, Rn tends towards the golden ratio. In other words, if we make an infinite ladder of resistors, we get an effective resistance of the golden ratio um, because it's just a known property of the Fibonacci sequence that the ratio of successive terms tends towards the golden ratio as n gets large. All right, I think that concludes this video. Thanks for watching and see you next time.